What's up with that this week is the Trinity. Now, let's talk candidly about the doctrine of the Trinity. No one can unpack the doctrine of the Trinity in 30 minutes. It just can't happen. Our finite minds cannot understand the full majesty of the King of glory. It's impossible. It is a mystery that we will never be able to fully understand. But today, I'm going to try with all that I am to unpack to you what he has revealed to me. So today, I am not preaching at you. I am going to share with you. And hopefully, this will spur us all on to take greater steps in our own personal Bible. Bible study of figuring out who he is in all parts. I'm going to say some statements to you right now, not to talk down to any of us, but to be very clear. Number one, God is three distinct persons. Number two, each person of the Trinity is fully God. Number three, there is one God. You want to ask me a question? What's up with that? God is infinite. We are finite. Even in our limited understanding, we have got to understand that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are three equal parts in one Godhead. Why do we need to understand that? Well, we study the doctrine of our faith. That means the reason we believe what we believe so that, number one, we can know God and bring him glory. That is the purpose of us as mankind, to understand who God is, to ascribe to him what he deserves, to bring him glory. Number two, so that we can accurately decipher his scriptures. If we don't know who he is, we cannot have a full understanding of what his word says and what it calls us to then do and be. Number three is so that we can apply his truths to our life. God is three persons. Let's talk about that a little bit. A couple of weeks ago, I shared with you, a second grade girl came into my office and said, tell me about when God began. And I went, hmm, good question. So we talked about what I'm about to share with you. And we talked about that God had no beginning. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is forever, an infinite God. He has always existed, but he hasn't always existed as just one of the parts of the Trinity. He has all three always existed in more than one person. Each exists as three persons, yet one God. Some of you are educators in this room. This is new math, people, all right? One plus one plus one is three. Doesn't make any sense, but it works, okay? Your children don't understand it either. Neither do I. Let's continue on. The doctrine of the Trinity is progressively revealed in scripture. What does that mean? A lot of people think, well, the father, we see him, the son, we see him, but there's no Holy Spirit that is clear in the Old Testament. That only shows up in the New Testament. We will talk about that today. The word Trinity is never found in the Bible. Did you know that? The word Trinity is not in God's word. What does the word Trinity mean? That means tri-unity. Three into one, or three in oneness. That's Michael, that's the M-I-B, Michael International Bible, right? Three in oneness, that is who God is. Sometimes people are looking for all three in the Bible, and that's what we're gonna unpack today. God exists as more than one person. Genesis 1, 26 says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image according to our likeness, multiplicity of entities there. What do the plural verb let us and the plural pronoun our mean? Some suggested that there's plurality of majesty in that statement, like you are a monarch, you are a king, you are a queen. Let us grant your requests. That is not what that means. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament Hebrew, there are no examples of plural verbs or plural pronouns used in monarch or majestic talk. How are you doing? You're looking at me like this. Let me stop here and be clear. Today, you will see me conduct myself in a way that is scholastic. Why? Not a lot of stories, not a lot of anecdotes, not a lot of funny because the material that we are navigating 
has to be so specific. This is the bedrock of who we are in our faith. The Bible talks about jot and tittle. The Bible talks about specificity, specificity in verbiage. This is the place where small allowances in what we think is correct can deter entirety of religion. Judaism, Jehovah's Witness, these are the things that we are going to talk through today. So if you see me speaking scholastically or reading a lot, it is because the material that we are handling is heightened. Does this make sense? Great. Whew. Let's talk about angels. In this first passage in Genesis, it says, let us. Some people think that God is talking to the angels here about participating in the creation of man. But there are no created beings in the creation of man. However, we do see here at the beginning of the Bible, plurality of persons in himself. Let us go and do those things. He's not talking to angelic beings or using some form of speech that was regal. He is talking about he, the Father, he, the Son, he, the Holy Spirit, the Godhead. Does this make sense? Let's look forward to the garden. Genesis 3.22 says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. Let's go to the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11.7. It says, Come let us go down there and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. When he commissions Isaiah, he speaks to him in 6.8 and it says, then I heard a loud voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then he said, here I am, send me. Notice here in this text that there is a combination of both singular and plural. Who shall I send? Who will go for us? He is talking about multiple people. Is this tracking with you? Do you understand what I'm saying? Isaiah 63.10 says that God's people rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit, Old Testament. Therefore, he turned himself to become their enemy and he fought against them. Why do we need to talk about the Holy Spirit being grieved? First of all, this shows us that the Holy Spirit in his person has humanistic characteristic. And what I mean by that is... The Holy Spirit is grieved, which suggests emotional capabilities characteristic of a distinct person. Why is this important? Because God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are equivalent. There is not one that is a lesser. There is not one that is more powerful. These are the same, three in one. These are just a few examples from the Old Testament. Let's go to the New Testament. Are you with me yet? Great. There is a more complete revelation of the Trinity in the New Testament. Why do we know that? Well, because obviously Jesus is born and then as he grows up, dies, and leaves, he, he leaves us, he gives us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit then comes, right? Matthew 3, 16, 17 says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, Jesus, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove alighting on him and a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. You want to ask me a question? What's up with that? Let's talk about it. Notice here that three members of the Trinity are performing three distinct activities. God the Son is being baptized and then is spoken to from heaven by God the Father. And the Holy Spirit is descending from heaven. Why? To rest upon and empower Jesus for his ministry. We see here the equivalency, Father, Son, 
Holy Spirit, and distinct personhood of all three. Are you getting it? Are you getting closer? As I'm unpacking this thing, are you seeing the merit in all three of them working together for the glory of the Lord collectively? At the end of Jesus's earthly ministry, we see him call his disciples to task. And in Matthew 28, 19, he said, go ye therefore into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Father and the Son are the most familiar of human institutions. What do we see here? We see family. If anyone on the planet understands family, good night, Southwest Louisiana, it is you. Father and son is a special relationship. Father and daughter is a special relationship. We see here that the Holy Spirit is named in calling them to be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is put in the same expression and on the same level with these two other persons, it is hard to deny that he is in equivalency. Do you understand what I'm saying? Many people think the Holy Spirit is just God's power or just a strength. No, 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 no. He is his own person. Very important. But dads, can I talk to the dads for just one second? Did you see the example of what fathers should do right here? Did you miss it? Everyone reads this passage and they are focused on Jesus and the Holy Spirit coming down. Baptism. But we miss that a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love and with whom I am well pleased. Dads, are you taking the example of God the Father and publicly in front of everyone else calling out your child to say, that's my boy, I love you, I'm proud of you. Man, I hope so. If we get nothing from the Trinity, if we get nothing from this sermon today, leave this place and on public display, blow up your son and daughter because you, a father,